sometimes we take for granted here the everyday stuff that we don't realize that other parts of the world, like that's the things that they think about every day. We're so blessed to be able to plan for the future, to be able to take care of our families, take care of our loved ones, and also take care of other people that we care about. Welcome to the show, Bashar. It's great to have you. I've been following you and now to have you here. It is such an awesome time. How are you? I am doing excellent. Thank you very much for having me. Excellent. No, you're absolutely uh, more than welcome. So let's get started. I've done a little bit of background um, and, and the backstory, which is quite nice that we're starting this, that life for you actually started in the Middle East. Because if I'm right in thinking you were born in Iraq. That is correct. Yeah, up until I was 16 years old and that's when I moved to the U.S. And I think from what I've read, that sort of experience has really shaped you, the um, relationship that you have with your father, um, living through troubled times in Iraq and during a war. Do you want to sort of elaborate a little bit on that? Because from what I've read, that's what shaped you as a person in the early years. Yeah, you know, um, the one thing that I love about the Western world is that you could actually, well, not just the, the Western world, really, any anywhere else that's outside of the the... You know, some parts of Asia, the Middle East, especially, uh, well, Iraq and that, that, that part of the world. But you could actually plan for the future. You could think about in five years and 10 years and 20 years, I can do this. Where I lived in Iraq, that was just not a possibility. That wasn't something that people thought about, especially after the war in 2003. The thing that we were, we were always wondering about is, will a rocket fa fall into my living room this afternoon, you know? Um, if I go to the grocery store, will I come back? My brother was in his mid twenties. He was always going out and partying and stuff like that. Not necessarily partying, but just going out with friends. And every time he went out, I know my, my mom and my dad would like have a heart attack and just like hold their breath until he got home. There wasn't cell phones. There wasn't any of that. So you couldn't just connect with someone anytime you wanted. And he would stay out late and it, they mm -hmm. would literally like, I would see the, the fear in their eyes until the minute he walked in. And so this was pretty much the everyday life. Is power going to be on today for three hours instead of four hours? Or is it going to be on for five hours instead of six hours? Like, that's the thing that you were thinking about. Can I go to the gas station and actually get gas instead of waiting two, three days in line to finally get gas? And so sometimes we take for granted here the everyday stuff that we don't realize that other parts of the world, like, that's the things that they think about every day. We're so blessed to be able to plan for the future, to be able to take care of our families, take care of our loved ones, and also take care of other people that we care about. And what, you know, that, that you talked about, you know, your, your father had a business in, in Iraq. Was that right? He started that. Is that where you got your entrepreneurial um, bug from, I guess you could say? Yeah, believe it or not, my father was actually, he owned the second largest factory, uh, clothing factory in Iraq in the late 70s, 80s, and early 90s up until the Gulf War in 91, and what, that's when the, I tell the story, the Iraqi dinar, one dinar used to equal three U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. Overnight, one U.S. dollar went to 1,200 dinars. So my father went from an, a multimillionaire to absolutely broke, literally overnight, you know? And then from wow. there, uh, uh, his businesses just, you know, uh, clashed and... Um, and yeah, but he, like, I always looked up to him. He was always a role model for me. He was a mover. He was a shaker. He was very known in the community. People respected him. And I always wanted to grow up to be like him. So you moved to the U.S. and then um, you went to university and that wasn't really the path of, of uh, well, it wasn't my path either, by the way. Um, but that was something that you were like, no, I'm, I'm going to change things. So you went and I think there's a little bit of a story there as well, isn't there? Yeah, well... My mom, so my sister was actually a lawyer in Iraq, and uh, my mom was very proud of that. You know, everywhere she went around, she talked about that. <laughs> and she, because I was actually pretty good in school. Like, I wasn't the kid that was, you know, skipping classes or whatever. I was always really good in school. I always did my homework. I would literally get home, not leave the, the room until I did my homework. So I was a pretty actually good uh, student. And then she sold me on the idea, especially after we let, we came to America, she sold me on the idea that if I want to be successful in life, look at your father. Being an entrepreneur is risky. You could literally go from a multimillionaire to nobody overnight. What's more safe, the safe route is going to school, getting a degree. And for her, it was like, look at your sister. She's a lawyer. What if you became a doctor? And so for a while there, she sold me on the idea that I should become a doctor, you know? 
Started going to school, started, um, I changed my major like six times. I, I was trying to get into biology and biochemistry. And it, after six months, seven months of, of taking classes, I just realized it just wasn't for me. I still remember I'd be sitting in the library trying to focus and literally a fly would go by like a mile away and I would like turn around. And I always used to, I had a label. I used to call myself, I am a procrastinator and I cannot focus. Those were the two things that I believed deep down, but it wasn't that. I was just uninspired. Mums mean well. I mean, that's the thing. So deep down, you meant well. And after everything that you'd gone through, I can understand. So what was the, I mean, was there a defining moment for you where you're like, no, enough, this is what I want to go in for myself? Or was it like a number of different things? Where if someone's listening to this, they might be going, yeah, I'm stuck in university. This is not what I want to be doing. Or, you know, what was your defining moment to change that? So for about the first uh, 15 years of my life, we were very, we looked wealthy on the outside, but we were very cash poor because my father had accumulated properties and stuff like that while he was, he had a business, but we didn't have a cash flowing business. And so after we came to America, completely broke, didn't have anything, started working at McDonald's, my first job. And then about four years in, my father was finally able to liquidate some properties back home and bring some money to America. So we, as a family, we bought a uh, uh, restaurant, a pizzeria, and that's the first time in my life at 20 years old, I was working 80 hours a week, uh, seven days, uh, no, no days off. Uh, we would open the store at 10 a.m. We would close at 9 a.m. So I was working 12 hours every single day. And not that I liked it, but I saw that if I put an effort – I could actually reap the reward because I could see that the harder I worked, the better the business became, the more, the better customers, you know, the more we could serve customers. And I had a really, I had a good thing happening with like customers and you know, I had a, I had, I had my ways to like satisfy customers and I had a good way to talk to people. And I had always before that worked in restaurants. I had two, two jobs at McDonald's and then I worked at a Greek restaurant for like three years. And then from there, I just realized that, you know, I could probably do this on my own. I was 22 at the time, and I was like, all right, I could probably branch out. My brother and I wanted to work together and, and create a franchise, but I was trying to go 150 miles an hour. He was trying to go five miles an hour, and we just would butt heads all the time. So I finally said, okay, I know this business thing. I like it. I enjoy it. I like the hard work. I finally came to my mom and said, mom, I love you, but I'm yeah. dropping out. Can't can't do it anymore. The doctor, it's never. It's not going to be. Yeah, not it's, be doctor. It's just not for me, you know. And and that's when I convinced my dad to go into business for myself. So. And that was the beginning of kind of where we're at now. And if we kind of like bring up to speed for those that don't know how they don't know, because there's 2.8 million people following you on on Instagram, which is amazing. Congratulations on on building that platform. You've got a YouTube following of over a hundred thousand. You know, you're active on on all the platforms. So, um, if we get into the sort of the business, the part, I guess one of my questions is how did you get to 2.8 million followers on Instagram? What was your, your strategy there? And I guess, what was it that you were selling or what is it that you're selling to get to that point? Yeah. You know, it was just, um, <laughs> it's, uh, I was going to say it was an overnight success, but it was nothing uh, near that. I got on social media in 2016, late 16, late 17. And oh, for wow. three years, three and a half years, there was nothing. There was literally no traction. In fact, 2021, January 2021, we had 30,000 followers on Instagram. January 2022, we had 1.3 million followers on Instagram. Wow. And so sometimes what happens is you put in work. It seems like it's little amounts of work. And you're just busting your ass doing everything you can. And it just seems like you're not getting anywhere, you know? Mm. But what often a lot of, peop a lot of times people miss is that to master anything, you need repetition and you need time. You know, it can't, like Cristiano Ronaldo isn't Cristiano Ronaldo because he picked up a ball at six years old and then six months later he said, nope, that's not for me. And then, you know, he kept on playing and playing and practicing. And if you, you know, watch his games 10 years ago, he wasn't who he is today. And 20 years ago, he wasn't who he is today, right? And so, but then for a long time, he was nobody. And then all of a sudden he blew up. And, but that's because all the work they had done prior to that. And so when people talk about overnight success, overnight success is when you found out about that person, that person was a nobody. And then they became a somebody and then they just blew up. And it's like, 
Where did this guy even came from? And that's something that I try to do every time I get together with uh, an entrepreneur friend. It's like we want to share what's going great in our businesses, but I'm always very curious about what's going wrong in your business, what's not working in your business, because we always are so proud about like, you know, bragging about the good things and we don't talk about the bad things, but it's the bad things that made you who you are. It's my restaurant burning down and me having no insurance in 2015, losing half a million dollars coming out of it with 150K in debt, going to jail six months later because of a DUI and, and being depressed for six months after that was why this all happened, you know? And then I, I busted my ass for the following five years. And that's where all this happened. Although it seemed like it happened overnight, but there was like a decade of work and trial and errors that led to all that stuff, you know? How do you get people to be honest about that? Because I feel, you know, social media is quite guilty or people are very guilty of putting on all the good stuff. It's always about the good stuff or not talking about what's going wrong. How do you change people's mindsets? Because I know mindsets is a big thing that you discuss in university that you have, uh, which we'll get onto in just a minute. So I'm curious about that mindset and maybe some of the others that you come across. I think what needs to happen is, and it's not easy, it's not an easy thing. What we need to start doing is we need to start finding happiness within oneself. And once you tap into that, that's where you stop worrying about everyone else. Because at the end of the day, like the reason why we start business, the reason why we, we go to school, the reason why we, you know, we use filters on Instagram, the reason why we get married, the reason why we have girlfriends and boyfriends and whatever, or friends or whatever it is, and, and, and we bear kids. The reason why, you know, women go through nine months of, of I mean, I, I don't even, that's the one thing that I'm like, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not a woman, right? And go through all that and have a child. The end result of all this stuff, the reason why we take pain because of pleasure, because of happiness, because of joy. That's the, the main core of everything that we do. The reason why we do everything, because we want to be happy, because we want to feel joy, right? It's not the money. It's not the business. It's not the child. It's not the boyfriend, girlfriend. It's not the sex. It's not this. It's the happiness. It's the joy that we feel, right? And so the minute that we make the shift from I need all these things to happen for me to feel happy. Two, I can find happiness within myself. I can be happy in the most miserable time of my life. My girlfriend could have dumped me last night and I can wake up this morning and feel absolute bliss, right? And that all comes from within, from inside, right? So the minute that a human can make that shift, they will stop worrying about what other people think of them. And when they stop worrying about what people think of them, then they will be okay with sharing anything and everything. Because the thing that we're always thinking about is, well, what if this person judges me? They're going to judge me on a moment that I've had in my life that maybe I didn't perform at my best or whatever. And then now they're really not going to see how awesome I am. And if they don't see how awesome I am, then I'm not going to feel good about myself. What are some strategies that have worked for you to develop that level of happiness or joy within you because I, I, I it took me till I was 40 to get to the point where the other people's opinions and feeling happy being on my own and and enjoying spending time and knowing that it's it's, it's all coming from me so I was a late I was late I think but at least I got there what are some of the things that worked for you yeah well first of all it's never late right? It's, it's better <laughs> to, to get there at 40. And by the way, I didn't even know you were 40. I thought you were in your, in your early thirties. You, you, you really can't tell that you're 40. Uh, so whatever you're doing, please share those secrets, right? Um, your next business. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's awesome. Um, but it's, it's the fact that you got there, right? And there is people that, that get up until their eighties and they die and they never, you know, they never get there. Right. Yeah, so true. And so I think sometimes what needs to happen is there needs to be um, like I follow uh, Tony Robbins a lot. And he talks about how there needs to, in order for you to create lasting change in your life, you need leverage. Right. Mm -hmm. You can become aware and create that leverage in your life or that leverage will happen in your life. And for me, five months ago, it was a seizure. It manifested in a seizure. Never in my life have I ever experienced anything like that. Out of nowhere, I fell down um, at a, uh, a supermarket and I had a seizure right in front of my, my wife's eyes and woke up in a hospital with a bunch of tubes in my arms and then they told me that I just had a seizure. And so for the following few weeks and months, I went into this, this level of anxiety and panic attacks I had never experienced in my life. 
I've launched nine businesses, seven of which failed. I've lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Nothing gave me anxiety as much as that, that not knowing what's going on, not knowing, do I have a tumor? Am I going to die in six months? You know, I haven't had kids yet. You know, I, I just started building my business, like all these crazy thoughts. And so what, where it all stems from, where unhappiness stems from is a single thought, right? It all comes from our mind. And so in order for you to, to find happiness within, within, you need to learn how to not control your thoughts. You'll never be able to do that because we're in this podcast and either I or you are probably thinking about, oh shit, I forgot to, you know, turn off the whatever. And oh my God, this person like that. And, you know, her internet, you know, whatever, right? Just all these crazy thoughts that are going on that just come through at random times and you can't stop their flow. But what you can do is you can master them and learn how to, which ones you pick and, and, and go in the rabbit hole with and which ones you just nip in the butt and say, nope, not this one, right? And, and there are some exercises, if you want, I can go into that I've used over the last five months from studying Tony Robbins, from you know finding a performance coach, from just getting within myself and, and, and soul searching um, that I've been able to learn to find happiness within. And I don't need, like I've always wanted the Rolls Royce. And once I got to be able to afford it, I'm like, am I buying it for me? Am I buying it for others? You know, is that really the goal in life? Is that really what I'm going to, to like, is that my legacy? You know, do I really want that to make me happy or can I be happy today with who I am? You know, and what's the answer to that? <laughs> I'll probably get it one day. Um, <laughs> I'll get it one day, but today I don't need it. We just got a car earlier this year and um, it's a lease. So three years from now, we'll see. Yeah. Nice. I, I want to touch a little bit more on that because you mentioned Tony Robbins, which was we're the star of my personal development journey. Um, I think what well, someone gave me some, this is again showing my age, but someone gave me some tapes or cassettes and, and I listened to them and I was like, wow, who is this guy, you know? Yeah. And, and that was where it was for me. And I've since, you know, done UPW, I've done Date With Destiny, um, and, and you know, many of the, the personal development uh, mentors that I, I've worked with and, and coaches have changed the way that I am as a person for the better and changed my business for the better. That's something that I know you do, and you have, we have mutual friends. Blake, who's also been on the podcast, met yeah. you at, um, was it Sam Oven? Is Sam, Sam Oven. Oven? Yes, yeah. I was a mastermind, yeah. Yeah, which um, he visits um, the US a couple of times a year. So tell me about this. I mean, it seems like a no-brainer question, like why are mentors so important? But I know that you've significantly invested this year because we chatted about it just before we came on live. Yeah. Why and what is the impact has on you? Well, see, this is um, when I analyzed the reason why my business fell, um, my restaurant business. Uh, so I, I, I bought a restaurant right after the, 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 the family restaurant in 2013, 2015, April 28, 2015. I got a call five minutes after I had left saying that the kitchen is on fire. By the time I got there, our kitchen was absolutely destroyed. Um, oh, I had stopped paying insurance four months prior to that. Um, my landlord sued me and kicked me out. And so when I looked back, a, you know, a few months later to kind of analyze the situation and, 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 and try to learn from it, you know, because for three, four months, I was just beating myself and then it was time to move on, but I needed to learn. And that's, I think what happens oftentimes is we fail, but we don't learn. We just move on or try to move on. Um, when I analyzed that situation, it was, I was a 23 year old kid with a big ego and I knew it all. No one could tell me what to do. I had all the answers. I knew exactly what to do in every single situation. At 23, I don't care who you are. You don't know shit. Your brain doesn't finish developing until 25, 26, right? And so biologically, it's not possible. So you thinking that you know it all is when, if you think that you know it all, that's when you, you should know and become aware that there is a ton of things you don't know, right? And so the next journey, you would think I would have learned. I started selling on Amazon and I tried to do it on my own again. I borrowed $7,000 and I lost it on a few products. Again, why? Because I thought I knew it all. And then I was like, all right, something is wrong here. There's something in this equation that obviously is not working. It's working for other people. It's not working for me. 
I bought a course and then I learned and then I tweaked and then I found success. I bought another course and I learned and tweaked and found more success. And then I realized that regardless what it is I'm trying to accomplish in life, someone else has done it before me. And someone else has gone to a point where it's like, look, yes, I have success, but I'm passionate about helping other people. Because to me, it was like, if you're so successful, why are you trying to sell me your st Why are you like sharing your secret with me? It just didn't make sense. But that's where people will fail. Because when you think that way, you are in a scarce mindset. And in mm -hmm. order for you to succeed in life, you need to learn how to go into an abundant mindset. Because an abundant mindset doesn't think I'm creating my own competition. Abundant mindset says I've learned, I've accomplished, I want to help someone else, right? And when you make that shift, like people talk about, oh, this person is a competition, this person is this. I'm like, dude, there's 7.5 billion humans on planet Earth. If you believe that there is competition, you're, you're delusional. You're just crazy, right? Elon Musk patented how to create electric cars and make the patent open. If he believed that competition existed, he wouldn't do that. He literally revolutionized an industry that's been the same for, I don't know how many hundreds of years, right? And then he made it open. Why? Because he believes in something way bigger than competition. He believes in making human, you know, humankind just a, a better civilization, right? And so he believes in, in something that's bigger than himself because he has an abundant mindset, right? If he had a scarce mindset, the world probably wouldn't be what it is today or what it's going to be in 10 or 20 years. So let's let's kind of talk about this. So we talked about mindset being something that you um, discuss in the university. Um, you are all about disrupting the educational system about what you're doing. Is that correct in saying that? That's the the goal. And I think even bigger than that, your your number one reach is to impact a million lives. Is that right? So it's a million lives at a time. When we first created the goal, it was we want to impact a million lives. And then I woke up one day and I'm like, dude, there are 7.5 billion humans on planet Earth. What do we do when we get to a million? You know, I don't want to stop there. So it's uh, we just literally added dot, dot, dot at a time. Okay, okay. I like yeah. it. So, so talk to me a little bit about the, the university and disrupting the educational, uh, educational system. Yeah. So, you know... Humans around the world, everyone, doesn't matter where you live, always want a better life. You know, always mm -hmm. want uh, uh, um, to live a better life. You know, want freedom, want to spend more time with their kids, want anything, you know, just whatever it is. And in order for you to have a better life, you need to improve your level of skills. But first, it starts with awareness. You need to even have an awareness of that there are other skills that I can acquire that will improve my level of, of life or how I live life. When I lived in Iraq and when we had only three TV channels and no internet, I wasn't aware. There was no level of awareness. I remember I went to Jordan, which is a neighboring country to Iraq, for literally two days, and I realized that there are paved streets and that streets could actually look clean and that there's actually lines in the middle that people have like multiple lanes they drive in and people don't like go on top of each other. <laughs> and so now I became aware that this thing exists. And although we were like, there was just a border between us, it was like a two hour car drive, right? So now I was aware that this thing existed. So my, now my standard increased, right? Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create awareness of missed opportunities because until now traditional education has had a monopoly on those skill sets. You yeah. need to go to a four year university, get a bachelor's degree, spend about 10 to $50,000 per year, accumulate a bunch of debt so that hopefully one day you can graduate and hopefully someone can hire you and maybe give you a job that pays 50, 60, $70,000 a year. So that 40 years later, you can hopefully hope, that there will be enough money for you to retire at 65 and live your golden years. It's more like just a death sentence while you're alive, right? Yeah. And so we wanted to collapse all that time and say, fuck that. I want to teach you a skill that you can turn into income within 90 days or less so they could do whatever the hell you want with your life, right? Mm -hmm. Because I didn't do it through a traditional university. Yes, yeah. we need doctors. Yes, we need lawyers. But let's face it. Not every human is going to become a doctor or a lawyer. I was pretty smart in school, and I was like, screw this. You know, this is not for me, right? You will always have the people that go to school and spend 65 years to becoming doctors or lawyers or whatever. 
But if you're those that don't want to do all that work and don't want to spend the next 20 years studying and want to instead get a, a degree, but an, a, 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 a skill that you could literally take and do whatever you want with your life, then BJK University is the place. Right now, we're focused on just Amazon because I started as an Amazon seller, so it was easy for me to create a program about it. But the future of BJK University is providing multi, you know, all kinds of different skills for people. Um, you know, the, these could be things uh, uh, in, in the trading uh, industry and you know, mm -hmm. real estate, crypto, just all kinds of different skills that people can take and turn into income within 90 days or less. That's incredible. And I do have to sort of labor a little bit onto that point that you said about, you know, university. Um, I remember making, I also didn't go to university because I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I couldn't see the logic in going to sure. study something for four years that when I spoke to everyone around me, no one was actually doing what they studied at school. Like it's like right. they went and they went to high, they went to university. But that's you know, like my, say my parents for example, they met at catering college. My dad went on to be a police officer. My mum was a HR director. Like neither of them are ended up in what they were doing. And I think so many people go, oh well, I'm just going to go to university because everyone else is. And yeah. rather than going, do you know what? I'm going to find out about myself. I'm going to travel. I'm going to experience this or try and make some money or, you know, become an Amazon seller and, and seeing what opportunities are out there. I couldn't agree more. And I think so often even the school system and what they're still teaching is just not what we need now. It frustrates me that, um, you know, I wish I'd known about, again, it's never too late, but I wish I'd known about personal development earlier. Then I yep. did. You know, why isn't that taught in schools? Why, why, why do we have to wait to one day someone hands us some cassette tapes? You know, when it's like you're having a bad moment and and it all goes to the next level. So I'm completely on this. And um, I mean, I, I don't know what the answer to this is to how to change it before. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like how, how. How can you reach people younger? I think by being an, an example, you know, by just being out there, by um, like uh, uh, when I uh, have been attending Tony Robbins uh, events the last couple of months, I've been seeing some of the, the people in our program are bringing in their kids, you know? So yeah, I yeah. think it's if you, create a, uh, if you create a level of awareness for the older generation, then they will get impacted and influenced and then they can influence the younger generation. So mm -hmm. for me, you know, I'm 32 right now. I'll... I'll we're planning on having uh, children here soon. And so if my job would be to influence them. And then obviously they, they, they will make their own decisions. I'm not going to make decisions for them, but influence them and, and provide them those opportunities and those, like give them that level of awareness, right? So I think our job is, because at the end of the day, it's all about, like you reach a certain level of financial freedom where it's like, it's not about me anymore. It's not about just a, a fancier car, fancier house, nicer dinners or whatever, it's about what is the what's the footprint that I'm going to leave in this world? You know, 60, 70 years from now when I'm gone, what are people going to remember me? Because when Warren Buffett or Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk are dead, no one's going to th say they had tens of billions of dollars. They're going to talk about the accomplishments they had. I, until today, I don't even know if Thomas Edison was a rich man or a poor man. I don't know. And neither do I give a shit, right? But what I remember him by is his innovations, right? I don't remember how much money he had or didn't have, you know? So... It's really important that we make it about other people. And then for the older generation, it's about creating awareness for them first. Mm -hmm. And then they could go and, and create awareness for the younger generation. Mm, yeah, great tip. I think at UPW, when I went, you know, maybe about eight years ago, there was a couple of kids at the Tony Robbins. But I think now more and more it's starting to change. The, oh, yeah. it, the next generation are bringing their kids along because they want them to see something a little bit different. Yeah. Um, let's talk about that leading by example. And, and I'm touching into sort of personal branding, being visible, being someone that someone looks at. And I, I, I was really um, excited to talk about your personal brand in a number of ways. One, you have a really distinctive personal brand. The mustache has nothing to do with the fact that it's Movember. This is your, your signature look. Yeah. How it did is. it come about, by the way? It came out of depression, to be honest with you. Um, okay. So after my restaurant burned down, I went into depression, and I started drinking heavily. I got a DUI, drinking under the influence. Um, I went to jail overnight. You know, I didn't spend a whole time in jail. But um, for the following four, five, six months, I started growing a beard. And my beard was literally like down to here. And then 
as I was starting to come out of that phase and like, you know, I started getting into online, uh, um, the whole online world and learning about this thing. And, and I saw, I finally started seeing the, 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 the light at the end of the tunnel. I decided to shave my beard. As I was shaving my beard, I was like, what is that? I've never seen that before. I now started, you know, and as I was growing up, uh, when I was little, my sister and mom used to watch Egyptian soap operas because <laughs> yes. Egypt, yeah, it's Egypt has like a, Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I know, you know, uh, in Dubai and there is a um, there is a culture in Egypt specifically. They have these big mustaches, like huge. Yeah. I mean, bigger than mine, way bigger than mine. And every when I like when I was little watching that, I was always like, that's a cool mustache. I wish I would and I can grow one in the future. And so when I was shaving my beard, I saw that and I'm like, oh, I like that. I'm going to keep it and like in the beginning it was all weird and was like tiny and stuff like that. Um, and then it, I just left it. And then, you know, my girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, hated it at first. You know, my, my friends started making fun of me. My parents were like, what the hell is this? And I just <laughs> kept it, you know, I just kept it and kept it and kept it until it became a thing, especially when BJK university was launched, people started recognizing me by the mustache. And, uh, earlier this year, late last year, actually, we were redoing our branding and our logo. And, um, and we integrated because our, our, our university is BJK university and it stands for Bashar Jamil Katu, Bashar J Katu. And so the J at the bottom, it's like that. And we just added a little thing on the other side and now yeah. the logo has a mustache. So now I'm stuck with it. Yeah. Until you change your logo. But I think more on that sort of, that's one key piece that's quite distinct in terms of your personal brand. People spot you, they see you, your social media is consistent. I think the other piece that I would like to draw attention to, and you've been so honest in this conversation, but I think that that's also just part and parcel of who you are. You know, you mm. talk about the fact that you've had challenges, you talk about the depression, you talk about, you know, incidents that have happened that are part of you that other people wouldn't. Um, how how does that come across? Because I think I think it's really important to be you. That is your personal brand. Other yeah. people don't. I guess for people listening, how has that impacted you being so honest with your business growth or with your your sort of your visibility and credibility? When I um, when I first started um, to like get into online education after I had made it as an Amazon seller. I started watching everyone and it was always about the Lamborghinis and the travel and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, I guess this is what I still remember. I, I watched a Ty Lopez uh, video and he said, you know, mm -hmm. there was, I guess he had done a study or something and the Lamborghini attracts like, I don't know more. He, like he had literally done a study and like it was all scientific and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, I don't like the Lamborghini, the car, but I guess I need a fancy car. So what I did is I went and bought a Bentley. And I, my plan was I'm going to put that belly in all of my ads, you know, because I started watching all the, and I started taking some courses of these like top gurus in my space. And I'm like, dude, this person does not know what they're talking about. Like they have a big brand, but their course is shit. They really <laughs> don't care about people, you know? And I was like, I know what I'm doing. I care about people, but I guess I need to do this in order for me to, to stand out. And I still remember I shot my first ad, which never made it because I looked like an asshole. I was watching the ad and I'm like, that's not me. Like I was talking in a way where I was like, who the hell is this guy? And then I ended up never driving the, the car. I ended up you know, selling it for like $30,000 or $40,000 loss. And, um, and I just started like doing videos on my phone. And I still remember one of the, the very first videos, it was attacking the gurus. It was like one of the very first, like right now everyone is like, oh, I'm not a guru, blah, blah, blah. But I had one of the first ads in 2018, 2019, attacking the gurus, talking about like, you're not going to see a jet. You're not going to see this. You're not going to see that because that's not who I am. And then we recently actually did a, a survey to all of our students trying to see why they enrolled in our program. Like just to yeah. see like, okay, what did we do right? How can I do more of it? And we were thinking it was this ad. It was this thing. It was that thing. 87% of people said Bashar seemed authentic. He seemed genuine and he seemed like he's down to earth and someone I can actually hang out and have a beer with. And I was like, that's very interesting, you know? And, and that's so, a brand. 
that's me. That's who I yeah. am. Like, yeah. like right now, this is who I am, you know? Mm -hmm. And actually my team literally loves when I do these podcasts because they're like, dude, this is like the, the most raw you can ever be. And they take those and they chop them up and do all kinds of stuff with them. But you know, what I realized is that we're always trying to become someone we're not. And this is why a lot of people either get burnt out or their things flop. And then they start calling the thing a scam or it doesn't work or whatever. But that's because you're pretending to be someone you're not. And when you do that, you're just going to get to a point where everyone has conscience. Everyone has a point where it's like I'm only willing to exchange my fakeness for so much. I'm going to get to a point where I'm going to burn out. Like this is who I am. I could be this all my life because I don't need to change. When I went to wearing all black about a year ago, it was from because my top core value is kiss, keeping it simple, stupid. And I would sometimes get, come on video or whatever, and it's like, oh, shit, I wore this shirt and this last video, let me go change or whatever. And then I went to completely black. Like literally right now, my closet has four shirts that are all the same, four jeans that are all the same, three different shoes, all black. Everything I wear is black, you know, and it's simple. It's clean. People know me for that as well. And that's who I am. I'm not pretending to be that. It's not like I'm on video wearing black and then I'm out there wearing orange. You know, that's not who I am, you know? So I think if you if you just default to who you truly are, regardless yes. who that is, you could be weird, you could be awkward, you could be autistic, you could be whatever. It doesn't matter. Just default to that. You will probably repel a lot of people, but that's okay. But you will also attract a whole bunch of people which will become your super fans. And that's exactly who we, what you want to do. That um, piece that you mentioned about the clothing and the four pieces, was that not, I'm sure I saw that on Sam Ovens. He also does that as well, where he's like, I, I have the same gray t-shirts and the same jeans. Yeah, I, I was inspired by him. And then mostly, uh, 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 my God, what's his name? Steve Jobs as well. I saw him, uh, I used to see him always wearing a black turtleneck and jeans, you know? Yeah. And uh, so I was very influenced by them too, yes. Yeah, so when, when I talk about, you know, from a personal branding perspective, you can either have a signature style or a uniform. And effectively right. what you're going for is more the, the, the uniform in the sense of here are these four things, these is my black, this is my signature look, but it's consistent. Um, I just wanted to circle back out of curiosity. You mentioned your team. How many do you have in your team? Uh, so right now we're about 65 people. Oh, wow. Okay. And that is all um, taking part on everything from, I guess, your social media content, because that is a huge part of your operation in terms of getting people visible and what have you to, um, to, to dealing with the back end of sort of university. What are some of the roles that maybe people wouldn't think about? Because I was like, wow, 65 is quite a lot. Yeah. So we have a marketing team of about seven people right now, seven, eight people. Yeah. Um, we have a sales team. We're heavy on sales because we do one-on-one uh, like consulting, um, yeah. uh, like strategy session. When someone comes in, it's not a it's not a sales page. It's a it's a one-on-one uh, strategy session. Um, so we're heavy on sales. We have about thirty salespeople, mm -hmm. and then we have our coaches inside of our program that work with our students and that are also continuously improving and and, and upgrading the program. Um, and then we're just in the process of building our finance department and, and our IT and, and admin department. There's about almost 10 people there. Um, and so those are kind of the major functions, sales, marketing, operations, and admin and finance. So if I can circle back to where we started and um, the sort of the entrepreneurship piece and what does, mum wanted you to be a doctor and, and dad, I think was a little bit, I think from one of the stories I'd read was maybe a little bit disappointed and, and where everything kind of went. What do they say now? Do they understand the business that you're in and, and what are their thoughts? And now going back to where my mom was, our parents just want to see us happy. You know, that's that's their thing. And they will try to impose things on you, but with the best intentions because that's all they know, right? Yeah. The reason why my mom wanted me to become a doctor wasn't because, yeah, part of it's, it's significance. You know, what Tony Robbins talks yeah. about person, uh, uh, human needs, right? One of them is significance. Yeah. She wanted to feel significant. But at the end of the day, it was also love because she wanted to – make sure that because she loves me, she wanted to make sure that I'm protected and taken care of. To her, that's all she knew. Doctor means success, right? Entrepreneur means risky because her husband was an entrepreneur, very successful, and bam, lost it all, right? And so for the longest time, up until about a year and a half ago, two years ago, she was like, I know one day, I know you'll go back to school. I know one day you'll, you'll become a doctor, you know? I, I was literally almost 30 years old. I was like five, six years into my entrepreneurship journey, 
and uh, she still believed that I was going to go to school. But today, they don't understand what I do. They see me on social media. Uh, their English is broken. You know, it's okay. They, mm-hmm. they get by. They watch every single video. They like every single video. They comment sometimes. And um, they don't understand exactly what I do. But, uh, you know, they feel very proud. But the, very, the thing that they are very proud of um, is in our culture. So I'm Chaldean. We're like 2% of uh, Catholics in Iraq. We're the only like, you know, Catholics of, of Iraq. We're called mm-hmm. Chaldeans. Yeah. And so um, in San Diego, we have a big Chaldean community. A lot of, not a lot, many of the Chaldean kids in our community are now our students in BJK University. So either when their spouses or their moms or they see my parents, they go up to them and they say, you know, I, I just want to introduce myself. Probably don't know who I am, but I'm one of Bashar's students and he's been helping me out so much. And, you know, or like I've made this much or whatever. And my parents are like more proud of that than anything else. You know, obviously they're proud of me because I'm doing great financially in life, but they're more proud of the fact that I'm actually helping people, especially, you know, my community. So. Yeah, love that. And it made me smile when you said, you know, your parents like and comment. I think the first two people that like and comment my stories, my posts, everything is my mom and my dad. I I think we must have have me. We must have notifications on because they're always so lovely. And I'm always so grateful for the for the support. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. How can people find you? Maybe just share a little bit of the details. And you've mentioned the university, social media, maybe just share those for a reminder for everyone. Yeah, so I mean, if you're looking for you know daily inspiration or want to learn more about what I do or anything really, I would just say go to Instagram, search Bashar JK2. That's B-A-S-H-A-R-J-K-A-T-O-U. There's gonna be probably a dozen. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of fake accounts trying to scam people. Yeah. It's the only one with a 2.8 million followers. By the time you're watching, it might be three or four or five or 10. I don't know. Um, but follow that page. And, um, you know, and if you want to connect, reach out and yeah. Awesome. Um, it right. was an absolute pleasure to have you um, here today sharing your story and um, inspiring others. Thank you so much. And um, have a great day. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.